Good evening. As always, if there are visitors amongst us this evening, we welcome them to Strand. And as we meet together in worship, we do hope that any who may be visiting with us will feel very much at home here in our congregation this evening. The services next Sunday, both services at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. will be taken by Mr. Boyce, and the evening service being the first Sunday in September is our monthly communion service. Then, uh, with regard to our congregational prayer meeting, there will be no prayer meeting next Sunday. The prayer meeting will revert to Saturday evening, beginning on Saturday the 8th of September at half past seven in the minor hall. The midweek meetings, it is hoped that the, the midweek meetings will begin again on Wednesday the 5th of September at eight o'clock. I would remind parents and children of our Sunday schools that they will recommence next Sunday at three o'clock in the afternoon. Then with regard to the Tuesday club, the parents evening on Tuesday of this week, would all those who are leading and helping in the Tuesday club, bringing down food, etc., for the parents' evening, could you please be down by six o'clock on Tuesday evening so that food can be set out and so on before the, the meeting starts at half past six. Then, with regard to the 2 7 discipleship training course, the first meeting of the course will be held on Sunday evening, the 9th of September, at half past eight. All the members of the course will meet together on this evening, uh, but for the remainder of the course will be divided into two groups, and those groups will be displayed on the notice boards at the back of the church. At that first meeting on Sunday the 9th of September, the course books will be given out and arrangements made for the weekly meetings of the two groups. Those are all the announcements. Thank you. Let us come together to worship God by using the, the words of hymn number 602. It's because of Jesus that we come to worship tonight. It's important that we come to have fellowship, but it's also important that we come to worship him and tell God what we think about him and, and uh, just to give him the praise and the glory. And it's him, him in verse 2 tells us, in him we live and our lives are in Christ and that's why we live is to praise him and to worship him. Let's praise God.
let's continue to worship God. Let's pray. Father God, we come tonight to worship you and to adore you and to celebrate your goodness to us. Lord, we want to come and just exalt you for who you are and what you've done in our lives. We thank you that we can call you Saviour because you died on the cross for us and that we're redeemed in your blood. And we thank you we can call you Lord because you're indeed the Lord of our lives and that you lead us on in the way that we should go. And Father, we thank you as we come and as we work for you. We thank you that we don't only work for you, but we work with you. We thank you your promise as we go out and tell people the good news about your Son, that you promised to be with us, and not only to be with us, but to give us your Spirit, to empower us to speak of your truth. Lord, we just ask you for your Spirit now to come down and fill us, that each one of us will be just filled with your Spirit, your Holy Spirit, that we may indeed worship you in truth and in spirit today. Lord, just be with us tonight to bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you tonight, if you turn to John chapter 8, the Gospel of John and chapter 8. The Gospel of John, chapter 8, and reading from verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered round him and sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses... In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the women still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Women, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and live your life of sin. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, Where is your Father? You do not know me or my Father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area, near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. Once more Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you will not come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? they asked. Just what I have been claiming all along, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable, and what I have heard from him I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling him about his father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, Then you will know that I am the man, I am the one I claim to be, and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. 
The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. Amen. Let's continue to worship God um, using the hymns of faith. And it's hymn number 490. 490. Let's praise God. tonight we just do what we did last time I was here during the time of intercession we'll just have a time of open prayer and if you'd like to pray well that's great but if you don't pray audibly well don't worry about that just pray inside and maybe pray for some of the things that I suggest again I'd like us to pray for the situation in the Gulf and uh, nothing's much changed since the last time I was here so we really want to pray for that situation that God will do, do a great work there and again pray for the family and the hostages held there in Iraq and in Kuwait. We want to praise God for the release of um, Ke- Brian Keenan. Fancy forgetting that name, Brian Keenan. You hear it every day in the news. And uh, we want to praise God for the release of Brian Keenan. And I want to pray that the Lord will use this to really speak to his heart. He was on the news there yesterday, and he doesn't look well at all. And it really seems to affect him. I want to pray for him and pray for his family that good will come out of this. Pray too for the other hostages left back there and in Beirut that the Lord will indeed do a great thing. Again, pray for those who are on holiday in the fellowship here and those who are sick. The Lord indeed really touch them and heal them. Let's talk, come together and pray. Father, we do praise you because we are confident that you've listened to our prayers, those that have been spoken, those unspoken. And Lord, we just want to leave those prayers before you, asking you to answer them in your will. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. As we offer God our offerings, we're going to sing 
from the Mission Praise book. Mission Praise 1 will be singing from number 69. He is Lord. <coughs> Sing it over another twice, and then we'll go on and sing Mission Praise 2, 405. So we'll sing His Lord again twice, and then we'll go straight into 405 in the Yellow Book. If you turn to your Bibles to John chapter 8, I thought tonight we'd look especially at verse 12. It says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I thought tonight we'd look at that claim of Christ. All throughout the book of John, there's different claims of Jesus. And here's a claim where he says, I'm the light of life. I am the light of the world. And I thought tonight we'd have a look at that and see what that means. What it meant to the people in Jesus' time and what it means for us today and how that should change our lives. 
At the time when Jesus said this, it would have been a day or two after the Feast of Tabernacles. And Jesus was up at that feast, if we read chapter 7, he went up to this feast. This was a very important feast for the people um, of Israel, for the Jews. It was a time when they remembered, the time when they were in the wilderness, how the Lord led them through the 40 years in the wilderness. And it was a time of rejoicing, a time of praising God for his faithfulness to them at that time. And they had many different rituals during that time. It was a week of festivals that they had, and different things happened on different days. And one of the days of the week, the, the priest would go forward to the temple, and he would get the, the big candlestick, uh, the seven-tiered ta- candlestick, and he would light the candlestick. And they would say that was the light of the world, because they remembered the time through the wilderness when God led them with the pillar of light. And this would have been very much in the minds of the people. And Jesus said, he was the light of the world. He was the light of life. And I think the reason why the Pharisees got so annoyed with him and they argued with him was the fact that they realized what Christ was saying. When they lit the the candlesticks, they said, this is the light of life. And they were talking about God, God Almighty, the God that led them through the wilderness, the God of Abraham. And here was Christ saying two or three days afterwards, I am the light of life. I am the light of the world. And they knew fine well he was saying, he was claiming that he was none other than the Son of God, God himself. And that's why I think they got so annoyed with him. And so I thought tonight we'd have a look and see what that means for us. And how should that change our lives? That if Jesus is saying to us, I am the light of the world, I am the light of life, how does that change our lives? Or how should it change our lives? I thought we'd first of all look at it in the aspect of the light of life. Jesus said, I am the light of life. The first thing we notice is he's saying he's the light. Very often today, in today's society, it's seen as Jesus is a light. Jesus is our way to heaven. He's only one of many ways. And we can either take Jesus or we can leave him. But here Jesus is saying in this verse, I am the light of the world. I am the light, the only way to God. I'm the only light that shines in the darkness. And any other lights are darkness next to the light of Christ the light of God. And this is something that's very important for us as Christians to realize. There's many, many good people about in society. There's many good religions throughout this world. Buddhism in Thailand is a good religion. Islam, to a certain extent, is a good religion. It teaches people to do good things. But next to Christ, their darkness. The good people that we, we live with and we work with, although they do good things, many for charity and for other things, But next to Christ, they're darkness, and they're not light at all. And we have to recognize that, we have to accept that, that Christ is the only light, is the only way of salvation, is the only way to God. And next to Christ, absolutely everything else is darkness and isn't light at all. And so Christ is saying he's the light of life. And that's quite a privilege for us, and that's quite a promise for us. Because what's that saying? If we allow Christ to enter our lives... If we accept Christ as our Saviour and our Lord, he promises to light up our darkness. He promises to come into our lives and bring that light with him, shining in our lives, taking away all the sin and the darkness in our life. If we were to look at the book of John, the Gospel of John, we see throughout the Gospel, whenever light is mentioned, it's talking about revelation. It's talking about God showing the way. Throughout the Old Testament, light is mentioned and it's called You know, the light of God is really more like his holiness and the holiness of God, apart from when it's in the wilderness there. But here, this is a new development that John brings out in the gospel, that whenever God enters our life, not only does he make us holy, not only does he cleanse us, but he shows us the way forward for our lives and he directs us in the way that we should go. And this is a privilege for us to take into and to accept him. Um, Just a few months ago, I was going round the doors in the Bloomfield area with a questionnaire. And it's amazing how many people, when you talk to them, would say, yes, well, I would attend church. I'm very faithful at church. And now and again, I would read my Bible. And now and again, I would pray. And then you would ask them, well, do you think you'll get into heaven? Do you think that you're good enough to get into heaven? And most people would say, well, I'm not a Christian, but I'm a good person. And, well, I don't do anybody any harm. And yes, I believe I'm going into heaven. I believe that I'm good enough. And here we read here that Jesus said, He's the light of the world. 
And whenever he shines into someone's life, they, they show them that we have nothing in ourselves that made us going into heaven. We have nothing in ourselves that made us standing before God. It's only when Christ shines into our lives to remove that darkness can we stand before God. And those people are mistaken. Many people today think that they're good enough, that they in their own way are light enough or have enough light to enter heaven because they do enough goodness. But here we read here that Christ is the light and as he shines into their lives, he can remove that darkness as each one of his has. But something else that's very encouraging, there's times in our Christian lives where I was mentioned this morning that we get depressed and that we have worries and we think, well, this past year has been a very difficult year and we're apprehensive about the future. When Christ has promised to be our light, he's promised to, to shine into our lives to remove the darkness of fear and apprehension for the future. As we go forward in Christ, we know that we are going in the proper path because Christ has promised to shine in our lives to lead us the way that we should go. But many people still have darkness within their lives. Many people still have that niggling feeling and think, well, Christ can come into my life. He can shine his light into my life, but you can't shine it in all of my area or all of my life. There's parts that are mine and for me to keep. There's many people today that hold grudges against others who maybe find it hard to forgive others because of things that have gone in the past. To God, that's darkness within the life. And we have to ask the light of the world to come into our lives and to shine in those areas that are very difficult. To ask Christ to forgive us for those times that we, we hold grudges against people and that we hold to things. Other people, you know, we find it difficult to go in our Christian lives because we feel we've done so much in the past that our sins so dark that the light of the world can't shine and take it away. And yet it's comforting to know that Christ is saying that he comes in and there's no darkness when he shines his light into our lives. And that we know whenever we follow Christ and whether we give our lives to Christ, he's promised to forgive us all of our sin. And although we may have regrets, they can be all forgotten about because Christ has promised to remove that from us, that there'll be no darkness within us. And that's something to be encouraged about, to be excited about. But with that promise and with that privilege comes a responsibility. It's a bit like in your office or in your work or wherever you may work. If the boss was to call you in and say, well, from now on, you're going to have your own office and you'll have your own private secretary and you'll have a bigger car, you'd feel real pleased with yourself. But from then on, there'll be more responsibility. The reason you get the better car and your own office and the personal secretary is because you've got promotion. You might get a better wage, but with that becomes more responsibility. And it's the same with your spiritual life. As Christ comes in and shines into your life to remove all those darknesses, all those dark corners that you might have, all those maybe past sins that you hold on to, with that becomes a responsibility. Because as Christ is the light of the world or the light of life, and he shines in us to remove our darkness. He expects us to be sons of the light. We read here in verses 1 to 11, how the light of the world is living in society. He will always disrupt society because society is dark. Society is full of sin and full of darkness. And we see here in verses 1 to 11, that was the case for Christ. Whenever Christ went about, there was always people trying to trick him and um, try and trap him into situations to say things that he wouldn't want to say and to put him into situations where he wouldn't want to go. And that was because he was the light shining in the darkness. And because he was the light shining in the darkness, the darkness didn't like it and so tried to trap the light. And we read here of the situation of this woman being brought to Jesus. And we can see the real darkness in that society because here's the Pharisees, the religious rulers of the day, stooping down. They weren't concerned about this woman at all. The only reason they brought this woman to Jesus was to trick him. They weren't concerned about the law of Moses. They weren't concerned about this poor woman. Here this, this woman was caught in adultery and here they were dragging her in front of everyone else and saying, here she is. Here's someone who's caught in adultery. What are you going to do with her? They weren't a bit concerned about her. They were people who were caught in darkness. And we see that Jesus scribbled something down in the sand. And a lot of people would try and argue and try and talk. What did Jesus write in the sand? Well, we really don't know. And it would be a waste of time trying to, to argue or trying to reason what he wrote. 
But I think what he was doing there was showing his repulse of the people, showing that he was really disgusted with their attitude. Here was the religious rulers, the people who were supposed to lead the people to God, coming down and stooping so low to bring this woman before him, just to trick her. As I say, not concerned about the woman, not concerned about the law of Moses, but concerned to trick Jesus. And I think he was just disgusted with that, that he just ignored them. And they continued to question him and say, well, Jesus, what do you think about it? Come on, tell us an answer. You're supposed to be a great man. Come on, you, you tell me something here. And here we see the Jesus, and he's disgusted. And he says, the first person who's sinned, who's committed adultery, who hasn't committed adultery, you cast the first stone. And we see this is the light of the world, shining in darkness and revealing the evil and revealing the darkness in the, in the supposedly religious leaders. As Jesus is living there in that society, he reveals the darkness. And we see that he turns the table on them. And from the oldest down to the youngest, they start to move away and leave because they realize that the light of the world is shining in their hearts. And then he knew the situation. He knew the darkness in their lives. And, and they went away and the situation just disappeared. And we, as sons of the light, have to be people like that. Jesus, I'm sure, was uncomfortable to be with at times. Jesus was maybe a thorn in their flesh at times. And we in our society, we have to be like that as sons of the light. Now that doesn't mean that we're arrogant and that we're always going in and we're always spoiling people's fun and we're spoil, spoil sports or we're holy joes or whatever. That doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that we have to stand for the truth. It does mean that when things are going, we have to be unpopular because we don't go with the crowd, because we have to stand up for what's right, because we are light in the society where we stand. Maybe in the worst situation, when people start to swear, they find it uncomfortable because we are in their presence, and they know that we don't like that, and we're offended by that. Or maybe they don't, I don't know. But we, as sons of the light, have to stand in society, and at times we'll be uncomfortable. At times we won't be light, but we have to shine that light to show that indeed we are the sons of the light, that indeed we are Christians, and that we stand for the right and for the truth in society. In Thailand, uh, there was this Christian man called Lung Ben, and he's the oldest Christian in the town where we lived, and I'd go often and visit him quite often. And Lung Ben has a mirror, and the mirror is so old that the back of the mirror has started to peel off. Do you know that the fine film of, I think it's metal that they have, so whenever you look at the mirror, you see your reflection. Well, Lung Ben's mirror is so old that the back started to peel off, and it means whenever you look in Lung Ben's mirror, you hardly see your face at all. You have to keep moving your face so that you can see what, what you have, that you can see you've got two eyes and a nose and two ears. And it's a terrible mirror, really, because when you look in that mirror, you only have one eye and one ear and half a chin because the, the bit at the back's all peeled off. And he's really the only man that I know that when he shaves, he shaves more by faith and less by sight because he can't really see what he sees in the mirror at all. But at times, you know, we can be like Lung Ben's mirror. At times, we're not a true reflection of the true light. We, as God's children, have to be a true image of the Father and of the Son. We have to be images of God and of Christ. We have to live in a life that when people look at us, they're able to say, he's a Christian because of the way he lives. She's a Christian because of the way she talks. Or she's a Christian just because the whole way she goes about things is so different from everybody else. We should be people like that, that are true images of Christ, and not be people like Lung Ben's mirror. That whenever they look at us, they only see half of Christ, or they only see a wee bit. That now and again we're, we're Christians when uh, it comes to maybe buying raffle tickets or whatever, but most of the time we're not. But we have to be true images of God. We have to be people who reflect God's light to others. And indeed, when they look at us, they're able to see that we are different, not because that we're holy joes, but because we reflect the true light and we reflect the light of Christ. And then Christ goes on and says, he's the light of the life, but he's also the light of the world. And I think this is something that's very important for us to grasp. Nowadays, we're so busy working within our church fellowship that sometimes we forget that not only are we to reflect God's light here, in Northern Ireland or here in East Belfast. But we're supposed to be lights of the world too. We're supposed to be involved in world mission. 
So often as a church, we can neglect world missions. We're so busy working here in our own area that we haven't got time to be involved in the work overseas. And yet, as Christians, we're expected to be involved in world missions. Each Christian, each one of us here tonight, if we're a son of the light or a daughter of the light, we have to be involved in some way in world missions. We have to be involved in praying, or for some of us, is to go and to be involved in giving towards missions. Jesus wasn't just a Jewish Messiah. He wasn't the light to the Jews. He wasn't the light to Israel, but he was the light to the world. Jesus shines in the world today. He's a Messiah not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. He's the Messiah not just for the Irish or the Scottish, but he's also the Messiah for all those countries in the Gulf, all those countries in Asia, all those countries in South America and in Africa and in Europe. The Messiah is supposed to reign all over the world. And the only way he can reign is when his people, the sons of the light, go out and reflect his light. The only way that Christ can be the light of the world today is if we go out and tell and reflect that light. And so each one of us have to be involved in world missions today. That might be for some of us to get involved in prayer and going along to prayer meetings and to pray for world missions. For some of us it might mean giving of our income towards world missions. And for some of us, and I think for many of us, it should be going and getting involved in world missions. This past year, I've been going around different churches and different prayer groups and deputation for the mission that I work for. And I've been amazed that most of the prayer meetings that I would attend for missions today, the average age would be about 60, maybe 65. And there's so many young people missing in, in prayer meetings today for missions. There's so many young people missing in praying for world missions. There's so many middle-aged people which I would say maybe 30 and upwards, or maybe 30 is still a young person, I'm 30, but maybe 40 and upwards. There's a lot of middle-aged people today, maybe 50, who are uh, not involved in praying for missions. They're not there in the prayer meetings, well, not the ones I've been attending anyway. There's so many people today are so involved in their own thing that they forget that they have to be involved in world missions too. They forget that their responsibility isn't just for Strand, it isn't just for East Belfast, but it's for the world as a whole. And we have to have our eyes open for that and be involved in that. Because, you know, as we go out and as we are lights in the world, we usually aren't welcomed wherever we go, whether that's in East Belfast or whether it's overseas. When I went to Thailand with my family, we weren't welcomed. When we went into Gamping Pet at first, um, a lot of people made us welcome, but mostly they didn't. Whenever we went into a village, we'd go in one week, and then the following week when we went back in again, uh, people would avoid us, because the priest had got wind that we'd come in, and he would preach against us, and he would tell people to keep clear of us. I remember one occasion when we had open ears, people would go by and spit at us, because we were pre uh, preaching the gospel. I remember another time we had a funeral, and uh, a group of witches came along, witches and wizards, and they were cursing and putting spells or on us as a group, because they didn't like us. We were different, and we were the light shining in the darkness. I have a friend who was in Africa recently, and uh, he said, the, the opposition to Christian things is terrific in, in the countries that have Islam as our main religion. And today, darkness doesn't want the light. Darkness opposes us, and yet as a Christian church, we shouldn't shrink back from that. We shouldn't shrink back and say, well, we'll just go where we're wanted. We'll just go where we're welcomed. But we as a Christian church should get up together and move and go into the dark places where we're not welcomed to preach the good news. I wonder when the last time there was an open air, an open air held in, say, the short strand. I'm sure there isn't too many down there or door-to-door -door work down in the short strand. I remember a few years ago, myself and two or three others went into the short strand area to do door-to-door -door work. And we only did it for two or three weeks and then trouble arose and um, we really couldn't get back in for a while. But you know, there's areas within Belfast here that are dark areas and there's areas that are neglected. And the reason they're neglected is because they're very, very difficult and they're, we're not wanted there. And yet as a Christian church, we should be praying for those areas and we should be going forward and finding an opportunity to share God's good news with those 
in those areas that are dark, in those areas that don't welcome us. But we have a responsibility to do that. But as we go forward with Christ as we are lights, as I say, we should have that idea that we should be involved in missions. Maybe you're thinking tonight, well, how can I get involved? What steps can I take? Well, I know that you have missionary prayer meetings here in the church. And the first step is to go along there and find out more about missions and to pray for missions. And as you pray for missions, then the Lord has opportunity to open your heart and to go forward. No one's too young to go forward to serve God in the mission field, and no one's too old either. Just a couple of years ago in the mission that I work with, we had two old age pensioners come forward, and they went over to the Ivory Coast to be missionaries in the Ivory Coast. They'd been teachers all their years, and when they retired, he took out retirement at 62, and his wife was, I think, 59, and they went off to be missionaries in the Ivory Coast. And so none of us are too old, none of us are too young to be involved in missions and to go forward and show, yes, I want to be a light in this world. I want to shine for Christ and I want to be involved in the local church here. But not only in the local church, I want to have my eyes on the world as Christ had concern for the world. We have to have that same concern. So let's go forward in our Christian lives. Let's remember that as the light shines in our lives, We mustn't contain that. We mustn't hold on to it and don't let it shine out. But we have to be like mirrors. And we have to let that light come through us and shine through. That people are able to see the light shining through us. Even though that's difficult at times. Even though we get oppressed because of that at times. But we have to do that as we shine for Christ. And then as we go forward we'll have opportunity to shine for him. Because we are the sons of the light. And let's be involved in world mission. Let's make a decision that will go forward and that will pray for people that maybe have gone out from this church fellowship or others that we know of, that as we pray with them, that we'll be involved in missions. As I was going around different prayer groups, that was one of the things I shared with them, that as we are involved in missions overseas, as we are working overseas, we are very much dependent on people praying for us back home. Sometimes, you know, when you're praying, you think, well, does it really do any good? God will bless them anyway. If they're missionaries, God will bless them. And whatever they do, God will be with them. And sometimes we feel there's really not much use praying for them. Yet when we were in Thailand, we really felt conscious of people praying for us at times. And we really felt there, just as they prayed for us, that the Lord indeed answered their prayers and gave us the ability, first of all, to learn the language and be able to share with people God's good news. And at times, when we're through difficult times, we really felt that people had been praying for us and we felt that. And it was an encouragement to us. And so we should be praying for people. And as we pray for them, we are involved in that work. We all can't go to Africa. We all can't go to Asia. But we can all go there in our prayers. And we can all be involved in that work. And we're as important as we pray back home as is the missionary working there in the mission field. They're ineffective if we're not praying for them. I'm firmly convinced of that. As we're behind them in prayer, then they are able to work there in the mission field. It has to be a oneness there because they are working for God's kingdom overseas. And as they are working for God's kingdom there, we have to be involved in that here in Strand or wherever that may be. So let's go forward and let's praise God and let's worship him. And let's accept that, that as we go forward, we don't need to have any fear because Christ is shining in our lives and he removes all that darkness, he removes that fear and apprehension, or whatever that we may have. But with that becomes a responsibility that we have to share it with others. Let's pray. Jesus, we do thank you that indeed you are the light of life, and that you shine in our lives, and you remove all those darkness, all those dark areas in our lives that we've maybe been holding on for years. Lord, we want to confess our sin to you, we want to confess the, the sin of unforgiveness where folk have done things in the past to us and we've held a grudge and we've thought, yes, well, we'll forgive them, but we won't forget. Lord, we want to come before you tonight and ask you to remove that darkness, remove that sin. Lord, we want to have that peace and that joy in our lives that comes from forgiveness. Lord, we won't want to hold these grudges any longer, but we ask you as a light to come into our lives to shine that light into those dark areas. And Lord, too, we just ask you to come into our lives to remove the regret that we have 
for the, the sins that we've committed in the past. Maybe we've asked you to forgive us in the past for all those sins, and yet we hold on to them. We think, Lord, you really can't forgive them because they've been so bad, they've been so serious. And in our eyes, Father, we live a life of regret. Tonight we want to recognize that you are the light of the life and that you shine in our lives. You can remove that sin and you can take that from us totally and that our life can be a light in the darkness in this society. And so, Lord, we thank you for that and we ask you to come in tonight to do that for us. But, Lord, help us to take our responsibility serious as we go out this week and live our lives. Lord, help us to be like mirrors, just reflecting the light of yourself. Help us, Father, to show that indeed as we stand in society that we are lights shining in the darkness, that indeed as we stand for the truth that people will see that we are different because we are light and they are darkness and that they may be drawn to us and accept that lightness too. Lord, we want to be people too who are involved in missions. Lord, we want to be people who are involved in praying for others overseas. Lord, we just ask you to open our minds and our hearts to this that we may know the next step for us, whether it's going along to prayer meetings or whether it's just being committed to hear more about missions and about individuals within different missions. Lord, we want to be able to pray intelligently for others. Lord, help us, Father, to get prayer letters and whatever that may be, to pray for them. And Lord, help us to be faithful in that. And as we're involved in that, Lord, we indeed will be the light of the world too. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's praise God again using the blue book here. It's hymn number 215, 215. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one of us, for now and forevermore. Amen. <clears throat>